the fact that so many of our young girls were getting pregnant especially most of them at school was uh, was seen as a shame to our community and so some of the elders started advancing uh, for FGM as a means of curbing this uh, uh, early pregnancies uh, from uh, our our society this is the end FGM podcast with Peter Kimei Welcome to the End FGM podcast. My name is Jeremiah Kipainoi. I spend time with change makers who are making an impact in Kenya and beyond. Each week, we listen to incredible stories of ordinary people just like you making a difference. They share their successes, failures, and what they are learning along the way. Thank you for being with me today. Let's get started. I am seated here with Peter Kimei, who was born and bred in Western Kenya, next to Eastern Uganda, and he is among the pioneering sons of the soil to be able to come to Nairobi in a public university and graduated and has been a role model in their community. And so today we speak with him about the work that he is doing in about land, or I'd just say Western Kenya. Karibu sana, uh, Peter Kemei. I'm very happy to be able to have you here today. Thank you very much. Just give me a background about your work. When did you begin? How do you begin? Uh, born and raised up uh, from that soil. Um, a graduate of Bachelor of Commerce, having undertaken operations management option. I've been raised to bearing in mind that it's the community that has raised me. I've actually carrying the community with me. What does that mean? Going in a local primary school, uh, competing against the best private schools at the area, and then emerging among the best uh, students then. I carried literally the whole community with me to my high school and to my campus, and so there's so much that they expected from me after my campus. And looking back at my community, seeing so many problems that I am inheriting from there, I thought, well, there is something I can do for them before I can do it for myself. Yes. Now, just a small background about your community. I understand that the Sabaot people are part of the bigger Kalenjin uh, community. And at some point, they abolished female genital mutilation. Just give me a background of, of, of your community. Because I hear they are like big brothers. Yes. Uh, for those who don't know, the Sabaot community sub- is one of the sub-tribes of the Kalenjin-speaking uh, nation. Now, uh, we, as the Sabaots, are referred to by the other uh, uh, Kalenjin sub-tribes as Kapkugo. This literally means we are the eldest, uh, uh, eldest brothers of, of the rest of the sub-tribes. We've been the custodians of the Kalenjin culture, and uh, FGM being one of them. Uh, we've been practicing this practice uh, openly until the year 2000, uh, when uh, it was uh, condemned internationally, globally. And luckily for us, we were the first, and we are the first sub-tribe to completely seize uh, and abolish the practice for quite some good period of time. You mean you stopped practicing female genital mutilation as a community? Yes, we stopped. Uh, we stopped practicing FGM as a community. Uh, as you know, it was accompanied by the uh, traditional male circumcision ceremonies. So boys and girls were circumcised at the same time? Yes. Boys and girls were circumcised at the same time. They played together. Uh, they were taken through the rites uh, all along. Even the healing was done uh, in caves where boys are taken through by the male and the ladies are taken through the, the practice by the, the old uh, gogos through the lessons. You specifically spoke about caves. Yes, uh, where... Uh, what happens is uh, during the practice before 
uh, this group of, of candidates uh, could uh, do the ceremonies together, even the actual circumcision, the practice, a boy will stand uh, next to a girl, a girl will die, uh, lie down, then next there is a boy who will be cut uh, same time. Wait, so the boys and girls would be cut at the same place, same time? Yes, cut same time, same place. So the candidates are brought in, uh, if, depending on the, uh, the age, or uh, let me say the position you hold in a family. If you are the eldest brother, for example, uh, you brought to be cut uh, first, then before uh, you are, you are uh, done with, then your sister will be brought, she lies down, she is cut. And then if all of you are complete, then the cutter will announce the, the ceremony a success and people will burst into cheers and celebrations and then prize giving to the candidates after the practices is done. I know FGM is our main topic, but I would like to get a background of Sabautland. Over time, I've heard about um, conflicts and there was the Sabaut Land Defense Force, it was SLDF, yes. and they were such a, a, a big problem in the Mount Elgon area. And during that background is the practice of FGM. How was it like then? Uh, traditionally, it's about, uh, let me say, uh, herdsmen. In fact, we, we were more of uh, how do you call it cattle farmers pastoralists yeah more of pastoralists than farmers you're doing little of uh, arable farming that is traditional yes we were uh, pastoralists we used to raid our neighbors uh, the pokots for cattle and they used to do the same uh, in our villages that uh, and that explains the 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 historical uh, coexistence between the Sabaots and the Pokots. Uh, from, from history, our brothers called the Bukusus, who were residing in eastern Uganda, uh, uh, were invited over as our herds, uh, herdsmen to help us in keeping the herds. So unfortunately for us is that we used to go out, uh, fight, uh, and raid our villages, then we leave these guys to look after our cattle. And they had no much to do, so our traditional men could stay away from their wives for quite some time. While these guys were kept warm, uh, then they were easy to uh, multiply as compared to us. So you want, you want to say that the Bukus were able to multiply much more um, faster than the Sabaot did because the Sabaot went whenever <laughs> available. That's true, and that explains why the current uh, uh, county of Bungoma, uh, traditionally it was a Bungoma district, purely occupied by 70% uh, about, but because of these guys uh, multiplying faster than us, they have now taken over the county. We are now the minorities in our own land. That is the traditional history about the Sabaot. Uh, history has it that uh, because of the music that our people also like very much, so it was a more of a form of family planning to them that uh, it could not help uh, our, our, our men uh, to have more sperm count as compared to our, <laughs> our brothers. I think you'll have to prove that scientifically. <laughs> anyway, um, we now move forward to, uh, we now move on to uh, female genital mutilation in uh, Western Kenya. We understand that, of course, you, uh, the Sabaot people, who are um, and are still pastoralists uh, in some way or another, although they've turned to arable farming. Um, we understand that there is a time that this practice had come almost to an end. So what happened? What led to the circumstances of making such decisions? Mm. What very, very, very few, few people know about uh, us as about is that when we make up a decision, we actually live to it. Uh, 
So in 2002 uh, is the last time we had a trace of a public uh, uh, ceremony for for FGM before any other sub-tribe or community in Kenya could denounce the practice. We were actually the first to say no to FGM and abolish it completely. It has been that way until the year 2012 when we have now seen the resurgence of FGM slowly in our community. And this was born out of the fact that uh, first uh, the issue of SLDF that emanated in 2006 to 2008. That's about land defense forces, the, the, the people fighting. Yes. So uh, I said it's about land defense forces came into being by the fact that we, uh, the, the reasons I've explained to you that uh, our, our brothers were multiplying faster than us and then they have taken over our land. So these people saw that uh, we can now, it's now time to defend our land from so-called foreigners who are actually our in-laws and uh, uncles because we were intermarried so much with them. Uh, so there was a proponent of the people who were agitating for the, our historical land. That is how the SLDF was born. And uh, this led to so, many, so much displacement of so many people uh, in our land. Uh, led to so many camps, IDPs, uh, in, in, our, in our land. And so through that, again, so many vulnerable girls were exposed to so much risk, including getting married off early, those who were going to school, getting pregnant and dropping out of school. And so it has been a trend. If you see the trend in Mount Elgon is that uh, teenage pregnancies and early marriages emanated out of SLDF. Now from 2007 to 2011, there were so many cases of teenage pregnancy. This resulting be of because of lawlessness brought about by SLDF. That's because it was a worry time, time for war. Yes, it was a worry time. Then it was more of another government altogether within Kenya. We had a different government in Mount Elgon collecting tax from people and passing judgments. So we had some people who had a such, such sort of entitlement to other people. They could break the law there, their masses. They could rape, maim, cut people, and punish. So that in led to so much uh, effects affecting the girls who were very much vulnerable. And secondly, the boys, boys uh, who were there also Again, this uh, sort of the boss mentality, they could um, boss around everyone as far as they saw that you are an inferior person. Yeah. And so, as, uh, as you had said earlier, uh, in 2002, the elders publicly denounced female genital mutilation um, among the Sabaoth community. And so, female genital mutilation uh, was not carried out publicly for almost a whole decade, since 2002 to 2012. But girls were of course still being cut at that time, weren't they? We cannot ascertain how many girls were cut, but what I can confirm is even my own half sister had to run away in 202 uh, to get cut, despite my father being very adamant that she cannot undergo the practice, having had the declaration of elders. And uh, so many people embraced it because they hear the voice of the elders. And uh, so, yeah, despite that, that the fact that uh, even the, the, the men and the father figures had embraced the fact that we should stop cutting our girls, there were some, some girls themselves, who are bound by the cultural, uh, who will cry to get cut. And so, yeah, oh, truth is there has been uh, FGM, but at a very low percentage as com since 2002 to 2012, uh, because everyone literally had embraced the, the fact that we we say no to FGM in Sabaotland. Uh, the fact that uh, there were these cases that emanated now from the year 2000 and 
11, 2012, uh, to date of so many girls getting pregnant at early age. Um, we had to see some elders now saying uh, we, we have allowed our girls to get immoral because we are not cutting them. But you said that um, during that period when FGM was on a low, uh, when SLDF was still very strong, there, there were very many cases of child marriages, uh, rape, and uh, basically other, uh, other forms of abuse directed towards women. And so that means that such cases were still existing even before 2012. Is it something that started from the war or is it something that was just deep-rooted, only that it's now emerging from 2012? Uh, the vices, um, especially uh, on rape, on uh, child marriages, got the roots, per se, f uh, uh, during the SLDF menace. Um, this because these people were homeless. Uh, and the people who are homeless can do anything. They are homeless and hopeless. You mean the community, the girls, or, or, or the fighters? The community were the biggest casualties of SLDF. SLDF was just a group of few guys who were terrorizing the whole, whole land. Uh, unfortunately, they were saying they were agitating for the, uh, the rights of the Sabaoth. But the biggest casualties of SLDF are this about themselves because these are the people who are chased out of their own lands and these are the people who are rendered homeless and then their families ended up um, if you had a girl of course most of them were vulnerable girls the, the only option they had is to get married or early to find a home and that home was found in a neighboring community probably Abukusu or a Teso, or another Kalenjin brother far away from our land. That is what led to a massive uh, uh, increase in cases of child marriages and early pregnancies. But worst, worst thing that happened during SLDF is the fact that uh, our young men and boys uh, were sort of um, radicalized to believe that they have a, source, a sense of entitlement. They could uh, do anything to please their masters. And this included uh, a defiling even their own sisters. Uh, because, as I said, it was a totally new government operating in Kenya at the hands of, of one or two people. Uh, and that is what led to the increase of of, of cases of teenage pregnancies and early marriages. Before then, um, yes, girls were cut. Unlike other communities, we cut girls when they are very old age. I could say 16 years. In fact, looking at the history of Sabaoths, the boys and girls were not cut. Uh, most boys were not cut below 20 years. So you are cut when you are a man. That is you are circumcised when you are a real man. After you get healed, and then you are taken through the processes of culture, and the trainings, then you are expected to marry after circumcision and start up your own family. The same happened to girls. They were never cut when they were young. You could cut a girl as old as 16, 18 years. In fact, I never witnessed a girl as young as 12 years being cut during those days so when it comes to early marriages and teenage marriages uh, teenage uh, pregnancies during those days uh, it's it was a rare a rare occasion it only came to four after sldf and so sldf fell uh, at around 2011. sldf was there uh, was um was defeated in 2008 um, and then uh, I think the effect is what we are seeing. What transpired for the two years, 2006 to 2008, was when SLDF was very rampant. So we are seeing people killing each other daily in presence of authorities. We are seeing uh, students very young uh, in primary and secondary schools being 
impregnated en masse, not one or two, more than 20 students, 20 people in a school falling pregnant in a certain uh, probably circumcision year. And yes, these are the trends that we attribute to the effects uh, brought about by SLDF. What happened? Yeah, the fact that so many of our young girls were getting pregnant, especially most of them at school, was uh, was seen as a shame to our community. And so some of the elders started advancing uh, for FGM as a means of curbing these uh, uh, early pregnancies uh, from uh, our our society. And that is why we've seen an, an, a resurgence of FGM secretly uh, uh, done in, in, in Mount Elgon among our teenage girls. And so the, the men sat down 10 years again, the same elders or different elders? We cannot say that a group of elders sat down and decided that, uh, that we now start cutting our gas again. No? Uh, mm, the Council of Elders, as far as I know it, uh, Council of Sabaut Elders, is firmly against FGM and they support the government in the fight against FGM. But there is a group of a few influential elders who are secretly advocating for this vice because they know very well that doing this in public will land them in trouble, in jail. So yes, uh, it's not uh, a declaration by the same elders. It's, uh, it's an advancement by a few influential elders from our, our community that are uh, calling for FGM as, um, as a way of uh, curbing teenage pregnancies among our girls. What might look like a legitimate cause for the men is actually harming these children because you might not have realized a decline in pregnancy rates after girls are cut. Or is there a difference? There is no difference per se. Uh, what we are seeing is more if uh, dire effects of FGM realized among our, our girls uh, in Mount Elgon. Uh, research. Uh, th there is a program uh, being carried out by uh, Fistula, Freedom from Fistula and Wadadia women uh, in, in Mount Elgon. And the data seen there is more worse because we've seen more than 500 uh, young mothers, and these are people aged under 18 years. In fact, if I may quote, the age bracket is between 12 years to 25 years diagnosed with fistula from Mount Elgon alone uh, for a period of less than five years. Um, it's something that we, we get worried of. Uh, and so, and again, most of these uh, fistula cases are attributed to FGM. And so when we see those effects are uh, coming out of four, uh, then we are more worried that FGM is not a solution to, to teenage pregnancies. And what still is, still ma many girls are dropping out of school due to teenage pregnancies. We are actually barring uh, several girls who are trying to do illegal abortions and safe abortions as a, as a result of teenage pregnancies. So... FGM is not a solution to teenage pregnancies. We can do better than advocating for another mistake that is harming our girls than protecting them. Female genital mutilation um, is a problem, not just in Sabaut land. It is a problem all over Kenya, even globally. And we have different um, people working within this field in Kenya and beyond. And there are different things that our communities do FGM for. And for your case, uh, it's towards curbing teenage pregnancies. So there is a select group of people, not specifically endorsed by the community, uh, because in this case, just like the Meru community, the Meru Council of Elders in Churin Cheke had abolished female genital mutilation um, in the 1950s. And now the same thing was done by the Sabaot elders in 2002, but still people are practicing it. 
Are there any other alternatives apart from the elders? Yes, there are other alternative uh, people to engage it. Uh, f- first, we realize that uh, uh, even though the elders, uh, the key stakeholders, there is always uh, a group of people that differ in opinion. And unfortunately, some of them might be very influential to an extent that uh, uh, the community might not hear the voice of elders. But we came to realize that the people who are practicing the vice, these are the cutters, uh, are actually very, very good people to engage in as far as uh, stopping this uh, FGM is concerned. And that's why as Adventure Youth Group, we are engaging the, the cutters. Uh, the, the reformed one have formed a group formally. We are using these reformed cutters to reach out to those who are still cutting, to join their group, to talk to the community of uh, the importance of not cutting their girls, and uh, of course tell the people uh, the reason why we are stopping, why we are all saying no to FGM. And this is a special group of people that we are engaging in Mount Elgon to campaign against FGM. You have the political support because the person who tabled the anti-FGM bill basically in parliament in, 20, um, in 2011, right, yes. uh, was and is the current MP for the area. How is it like working with political leaders? Is there support from the ground? We, just like any other uh, FGM practicing region, our politicians sees FGM as an issue. As far as Mount Elgon is concerned, they really, in fact, they believe that the practice is dead. Uh, so our MP was the one who tabled the bill in Parliament, uh, MP Fred Caponi, Honorable Fred Caponi. We have seen him come out in public uh, uh, saying we should, as a community, uh, stop FGM. He supports our activities in in activities, in uh, campaigning against the vice. Uh, all other political leaders uh, do support uh, our, our activities as Adventure Youth Group. In fact, they were the major stakeholders in our NFGM half marathon. But yeah, I, I think I'd also like to hear about that marathon uh, because I know, of course, the Kalenjin people are known for running. So what were you running for? Yeah, uh, we were not running just for fun or to win a prize. We were running for a reason. We were running to rally the community, the whole about community against uh, FGM. And that's why we call the race and FGM half marathon. So basically we were calling up um, the whole community, drawn away all the way from Cheptais to Kaboyo to come and uh, join hands. Uh, we got on board uh, political leaders from MCA to the women rep, uh, the opinion shapers, uh, the DCC, the sub-county uh, administrators, uh, NAT, or leadership, uh, teachers, union, and every key person that is uh, useful uh, in advancing the voice to say no to FGM uh, was brought on board. And they gave they gave their commitment uh, in public that uh, we need to say no to FGM. And yes, we are seeing fruits. We are hoping that the vice becomes a thing of the past once again. So as you bring this to a close, of course, I know that this community has a background of um, insecurity, and we also have a background where elders have been on both sides of ending this vice. Today we stand here, you having worked there, uh, tapping into people's talents and what they can do best, like marathons in uh, the, the, the Mount Elgon area. But also you face challenges where uh, these remote places, I said that sometimes even creative ways of getting girls to be cut, which involves taking them to the caves and doing all the activities there without really publicizing it is one of the challenges that you face currently in the fight against female genital mutilation in um, in this about land areas because of course there are still girls who are undergoing this vice whether they want it or not 
for reasons that vary. What would you say would work right now? I think the what we need to do is continuous dialogue, engaging the community uh, without relenting, telling them that uh, FGM is not a solution to teenage pregnancies. It's not a solution to child marriages. It's more of an addition to a problem to a girls than solving any other problem. Once our community realizes this, they will stop. And as I said, once we about say no, we mean it. And I envision that uh, very soon FGM will be a thing of the past in Mount Elgon if we continuously engage them. Um, uh, the secondly, we need the government to up uh, its uh, efforts in bringing uh, the security um, situation into camp. We need to solve that insecurity problem once and for all. Uh, um, then we need counseling, uh, putting in mind that uh, the effects we are seeing now are as a result of SLDF menace. So continuous counseling of, of our people uh, is much needed so that we can move on from the effects of SLDF. All right, we bring this to a close right now. I know we cannot be able to talk about everything about female genital mutilation, how to end it down there in Mount Elgon, but I'll be very happy to um, to have this conversation once again somewhere else or even here. Uh, but if someone wants to get in touch with you, how would they be able to reach you? We we have our, our social media handles at AdventureYG underscore ke youth group yg yes uh, that is on twitter uh, facebook you can get us at adventure youth group kenya you can reach directly to us via email at adventure youth group at gmail.com yes get in touch with us we will be glad to engage you amazing thank you so much uh pc peter c kimei uh, we are so happy um personally very happy and privileged to have you here today Thank you very much for sparing some time to talk to me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for hosting me on this very, very hot seat. <laughs> hot seat. <laughs> okay, so um, my name is Jeremiah Kipa. I know you've been listening to uh, the End FGM podcast with Peter Kemei, who comes from Mount Elgon. They'd like to say from Western Kenya. And those from Uganda would say from Eastern Uganda. You can get bonus materials, notes, and much more at www.kipainoi.com. K-I-P-A-I-N-O-I.com. Please remember, we all can do something. Go out and make a difference. For we all have a responsibility to make this world a better place. Goodbye.